Alabama lost again on Saturday. And while that might seem in, unconscionable to some people, like that's it's just what what happens sometimes in a football game is you win some, you lose some. And Alabama fans, and I don't even know that it's Alabama fans, to tell you the truth. I think there is an expectation from people that Alabama fans are going to be psychos maybe more than they actually are slash have been psychos. But the prevailing thought continues to be Kalen DeBoer better figure this out or Alabama is going to fire him. They're going to run him right out of town. He's going to be in trouble. They lose to Missouri on Saturday or they lose. They go to Baton Rouge and they don't play well. I don't know. You don't know the truth. Kalen DeBoer doesn't got to figure it out in 2024. He doesn't. He doesn't have to figure it out in 2024. He doesn't have anything to worry about. Not one thing. He got to win one more game. He got to get Alabama to a bowl game. And they got Mercer on the schedule. And hell, Mercer might not even be the most slam dunk win for them. Looking at you, Auburn. We might talk about you later in the week. My God. Kalen DeBoer does not have to figure it out before Thanksgiving or even the week after Thanksgiving. He didn't have to. There is not a scenario outside of something happening off the football field where Kalen DeBoer gets fired in year number one in Alabama. So we can stop that right now. Would it be preferential for Alabama to figure it out? Would it be best for the recruiting efforts, for NIL money coming in and the boosters being happy if Kalen DeBoer wins out from here on out, goes 10-2, and two, finds himself in the playoff? Yes, absolutely, 100% unequivocally, yes. But the idea that he's got something to worry about if they lose on Saturday or if they don't beat LSU or they fall to Oklahoma, it does not exist. It could be a precursor for what's to come, and maybe, just maybe, he might not be the guy at Alabama. I would say that that says more about the Crimson Tide than it says about him. Because if you've won everywhere you've been, and then you get to the college football mountaintop that is coaching the Alabama Crimson Tide, and you don't win there, I don't know that it's your fault. But that's probably a different discussion for a different day. The idea that any of this matters, year number one in a regime does not matter. Whether you are the head coach at Alabama or South Alabama, year number one is a write-off. And despite Alabama still having really high expectations coming into the 2024 season, despite the idea that we're so great, even the greatest coach to ever do it leaving our program is not going to topple us from the upper echelons of the sport is probably an unrealistic expectation. Alabama lost a lot of, a lot of kids in the transfer portal when Nick Saban left. Some of their best players. Things happen. Things change, and that's okay. The idea that Alabama was not going to skip a beat when Nick Saban retired is ridiculous. And Kalen DeBoer, who's a very, very, very good coach, did not forget how to coach. And the idea that because they only beat Georgia by a touchdown when they probably should have lost, they lost to Vanderbilt, only beat South Carolina by two, and then lost to Tennessee. Like, by the way, that's a difficult stretch. <laughs> like that's those are, and then they'll, they'll play Mizzou on Saturday before a bye week, where they then play LSU. That's a difficult stretch. I know we don't give Vanderbilt any credit whatsoever. They are five and two. Their losses are in overtime to a top twenty-five ranked team, and then Georgia State. But we don't talk about that. Yes. Is Vanderbilt, a, or no, is Vanderbilt a juggernaut? No. But they're still good. They're good enough. They are still okay, maybe, is the more palatable way to say it for you. They've, got, they've won five games through week eight of the college football season. They deserve a little bit of credit. Now, should Vanderbilt ever beat Alabama? No, probably not. 
But I'm here to tell you that if you think, and, and it's not just a Kalen DeBoer thing either. Sharon Moore at Michigan. Well, they're four and three, probably staring a six and six season right in the face. Yeah. Because year number one doesn't really matter. If you can turn year number one into something great, i.e. Kurt Signetti in Indiana, if you can turn it into something great, all it does is benefit you. But the idea that your program is tank torpedoed, holy God, we're never coming back because we sucked in year number one under a first-year head coach. It just it doesn't exist. And you would think Alabama fans would know that, right? Like Nick Saban lost to UL Monroe in year number one. And it wasn't that long ago that you lost to UL Monroe in year one of the Nick Saban era. Did you think at that time, oh my gosh, we got this higher wrong. This is ridiculous. We're never going to be any good under this guy. No, of course not. Like no reasonable person. Of course, sometimes Alabama fans might not be reasonable. The idea that this year is a make or break year. If he doesn't get it right, he might hit the dusty track. That's not true. Under no circumstances, no whatever happened. He could have went 0-12, and, and guess what? Caleb DeBoer is going to get a year number two. That's just not the way. Like, Do I think college football turns over coaches too quickly? Because if you haven't figured it out after about year two, like if Caleb DeBoer is – five and three at this stage next year does he have question marks or they're going to be like hey buddy i think the standard is the standard and you are not hitting the standard yeah probably but in year number one it don't matter in year number one you are changing things and i know that you might think like not a lot of alabama needs changed i get that but a new coach is going to come into a program and put their stamp on it and getting their stamp on something takes time and you're not going to be a hundred percent perfect in year number one those are unreasonable expectations and so when you know that when you know that if Nick Saban probably thought I could go out if I could spend one more year in 2024 as a head coach of the Crimson Tide and I could win a national title I probably am not stepping aside that kind of tells you all you need to know and by the way, the season is not over for Alabama by any stretch of the imagination. You beat Mizzou on Saturday. There's another top 25 win. A bye week. Then you go to Baton Rouge. If you lose that game, you're 6-3 and three with Mercer, Oklahoma, and Auburn left. You're probably staring 9-3. and three, And I'm here to tell you that 9-3 and three in the SEC, when your losses are to Alabama, LSU, who if they beat you, will be in the top 10 still, maybe a top five. Tennessee, who at that stage, probably a top 10 team. And to Vanderbilt, who is probably not going to stay in the top 25 for all that long, if we're being totally honest. Like they play Texas on Saturday. I, I, don't, I don't like the chances. And then they still got to play LSU and Tennessee. So, yeah. But there's Alabama can lose again and still be a fringe playoff contender. And I know this might be difficult to swallow. But 9-3 and three in a playoff contender should be acceptable at about 99% of college football programs. And for Alabama fans, to the expectation to be, we are going 13-0 every year and being the number one seed in the SEC turn, the number one seed in the college football playoff after winning the SEC championship. Those days are over for right now. And you're going to have to be okay with that because you know what? Every other college football program outside of, I would say Georgia expects to be 13 and 0 every year and win the SEC. I would say that Ohio State expects to be 13 and 0 and win the Big Ten every year. And probably Clemson expects to be 13 and 0. And that's because it takes a word a little time to travel to Clemson. Uh, that they expect to be 13 0 and win the ACC every year. Outside of that, being a fringe playoff contender is going to have to be good enough. Because you know what? Penn State has a slightly less 
historic program in the annals of college football history than Alabama. Penn State should be overjoyed if they are 10-2 and and in the college football playoff. Florida right now would probably sell you their left nut to be 9-3 and in a fringe college football playoff contender. LSU would absolutely take being in the college football playoff. Nebraska, Oklahoma, do you know what they would do to be 5-2 and two with the idea that, hey, we are still in the race for the college football playoff? So sometimes it's about perspective. But the perspective right now is Kalen DeBoer doesn't have to figure this out by the end of the season or there's trouble in paradise. There isn't. He doesn't have to figure out anything right now. He might have to answer for things later on down the line of was year number one an aberration or was year number one getting acclimated? But any idea that by in in the next six weeks that if things just go horribly off the rails, could he be the next head coach at Indiana when Florida hires Kurt Signet? No, (laughs) no, none of that's going to happen. So let's pump the brakes and come back to like real world for just a moment. Because while the expectations are still high and the standard is the standard, he doesn't have to meet the standard in year number one. And I think some people need to come to grips with that. That'll do it for today's episode of the Daily Huddle. Appreciate you making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing so. If you are watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you're getting all the great college football content we are pumping out. If you're listening on the podcast feed, drop a five-star review. goes a long way in helping out the channel. See you tomorrow for another episode of the Daily Huddle.